accuracy or immunogenicity. And uh, phase three is to demonstrate or confirm therapeutic benefit or protection in case of vaccines. And after that, the new uh, the uh, drug gets approved and subsequently uh, phase four are post-marketing surveillance, phase four clinical trials, registries, et cetera. There's another uh, uh, clinical trial which we know, uh, which is known as the academic clinical trial, which is the clinical trial of a drug that is already approved. And this has been tried for by the researcher academic for academic uh, or research institution for a new indication, new route of administration, new dose or new dosage form. And the results of such trial, they are intended to be used only for academic or research purpose. And this results will not be used for marketing or commercial purpose. For example, an already approved drug, right? For example, in TB, we had tried the higher dosage of rifampicin. So rifampicin is a drug that is already approved in TB at a particular dosage, and we tried the higher dosage. So that is uh, an academic clinical trial. And a drug which is uh, approved for some other indication like metformin was used uh, uh, as a host directed therapy in TB and that drug has already been approved for uh, use in diabetics. So these kind of trials, uh, they require approval from the ethics committee and not necessarily be submitted to the central licensing authority for approval. So the clinical trials should, or, should be conducted in accor accordance with applicable regulations and guidelines. And so clinical trial within the regulatory ambit that uh, what we saw as a new drug has to be uh, uh, approved by the Central Licensing Authority, the CDSU. The new drugs and clinical trial rules has to be followed uh, for those trials. And uh, they should be scientifically and ethically sound and before taking on phase one studies in humans, preclinical pre studies should precede trials before uh, uh, it comes to humans. And clinical trials, be it academic or regulatory, must be prospectively registered with the uh, CTRI. And uh, the ECs which uh, uh, review the I think, uh, uh, review the uh, clinical trial for approval, they should have quorum that is satisfied. And especially if they are reviewing new drugs uh, that is needs to be approved by Central Licensing Authority, that type of ethics committee has to be registered with the CDSCO also. So this is the Clinical Trial Registry of India. So any clinical trial has to be uh, registered prior to screening and uh, enrollment of study participants in this registry. And uh, in case of ethics committee, the ethics committee, which are reviewing the clinical trials, have to be registered with the CDSCO or and DHR. And uh, the ethics committee has to review the protocol prior to initiation of the trial. The, they should have a quorum when they are reviewing the uh, clinical trial. So quorum actually consists of five members. So it is a responsibility of the committee to ensure these five members are present when during the committee meeting, when a clinical trial is reviewed and granted approval, there should be a medical scientist, preferably a pharmacologist, a clinician, a legal expert, a social scientist or representative of NGO, a philosopher or ethicist, and a lay person. It's not only uh, uh, important to conduct an initial review, but the ethics committee has to conduct ongoing review of the trial for the trial progress. And that kind of ongoing review uh, depends upon what risk the trial offers, uh, uh, like kind of a very new drug, then it is once uh, in three months or so. Otherwise, it is an already approved drug, then it is uh, once in six months. And the ethics committee would review the adverse events in detail, especially the serious adverse events. And the ethics committee uh, will decide the quantum of compensation if it's trial-related injury. And they have the responsibility for maintaining the records of clinical trials for five years after completion of every trial. So this is the ethics committee registration portal and CDSEO. They are going to review, uh, review the uh, new drug clinical trials and the registration is valid for a period of five years. And this is a registration portal with DHR. So any ethics committee that reviews biomedical and health research has to be registered with the DHR.
So while reviewing or designing the protocol, the important ethical issues that need to be looked at is uh, in terms of qualification of the researcher, whether he's adequately competent enough to uh, undertake such a research study, adequacy of the sites according to the number of uh, participants that are uh, planned to be recruited, the scientific design and the study conduct. So whether it is appropriate, whether the inclusion and exclusion criteria is uh, 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 okay so that people are not exposed unnecessarily to harm, the selection and recruitment of uh, participants, whether it is fair to fulfill the uh, ethical requirement of justice, whether the informed consent process is appropriate, appropriate benefit risk assessment has been done, protection of privacy and confidentiality is there, payment for participants is there as part of uh, when they uh, participate in the trial plans for medical management and compensation for any research related injury and what are the social values that are involved in this study community considerations in terms of community engagement and disclosure of conflict of interest so in terms of informed consent process so this is actually uh, uh, fulfilling their basic ethical uh, requirement of autonomy so it protects the individual's autonomy to freely make a choice whether or not to participate in research so it has three components that providing relevant information and that information has to be comprehended by the potential study participant and therein voluntarily he agree he or she agrees to participate in this study so it should be in simple layman's language and it should be approved by the ethics committee. Uh, predominantly the written informed consent from the participant or legally authorized representative in terms if, if it the participant is vulnerable. So in terms of clinical trials, so what should be there, the basic elements that need to be there in an uh, informed consent document is that the, it should mention that the study involves research and explanation of the purpose of research what is the duration that the participant has to be in the study? What procedures are to be followed, whether it is invasive, non-invasive, everything, and any unforeseeable risks or discomfort. For example, if you are using a drug, what are the potential side effects that the drug can cause? Description of any benefits reasonably expected from research, not overstating it. And this statement has to be uh, very closely looked by the ethics committee because it would be an undue coercion to include participants into the study. Disclosure of specific appropriate alternate procedures or therapy. So you should give the option to the potential participant that apart from this, there are other things that are available and this is not the only thing for them. And uh, the extent to which confidentiality of records will be maintained and who will have access to it. The treatment schedule, the probability of random assignment for treatment if it's a randomized trial and both what kind of financial compensation and medical management will be provided and uh, in case of any injury whom to contact in that time and what is the payment that will be offered to them if they are participating in the trial and what are the participants responsibilities that they should keep up their appointments take their drugs regularly everything like uh, what is needed from them has to be mentioned and the statement that the participation is voluntary and they can withdraw from the study at any time and refusal will not cause them any penalty or loss of benefits with, to which the participant is otherwise entitled. And uh, a statement there's a possibility of failure of the investigational product to provide the intended therapeutic effect. In case of placebo controlled trial, the placebo does not have any therapeutic effect has to be told. So these are the main essential information. Uh, any other pertinent information like number of study participants, uh, where and all the study will be conducted. Apart from that, these things can be told. So uh, the researchers, as well as uh, all the stakeholders like ethics committee have to consider what type of study participants are included and whether they are vulnerable. So if the study participant is vulnerable, it it means that uh, the autonomy gets compromised. So the uh, patient is not able to comprehend or understand that he's going to be a potential participant for research because in, in terms of they may be incapable of making a voluntary informed decision for themselves, like children mentally ill or cognitively impaired, or they may be unduly influenced either by the expectation of benefits or fear of retaliation. 
like institutionalized people, uh, are people uh, who are prisoners or uh, in an old age home. So because of uh, some fear, they would say they would participate in the study or voluntariness or understanding is compromised due to their situational conditions like terminally ill patients who are really wanting to look at some form of a therapy for their illness and patients suffering from stigmatizing or rare diseases or socially or economically politically disadvantaged people like tribal populations, sexual minorities, refugees and migrants. So one must look into what type of study population that are involved because by nature of their vulnerability, they should not be unnecessarily involved in research to benefit others. So principles of research in vulnerable population should be, research should be done only if vulnerable population will get benefited and uh, participants should be empowered to the extent possible so that they can make their own decisions. And that is where we take the help of legally authorized or acceptable representative in the decision making uh, process. So in the best interest of the participant, this kind of uh, 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 arrangement needs to be done. Special care to ensure the privacy and confidentiality has to be there and uh, the right safety and well-being of the participants have to be uh, protected. So in terms of children, uh, there is the National Ethical Guidelines for Biomedical Research involving children. Uh, it was released in 2017. So uh, this guideline has to be gone through in detail if uh, research participants are children for additional uh, requirements like assent and how the assent has to be taken. So in terms of clinical trials, uh, which involves drugs or other vaccines or anything, patients should not be charged for any trial-related interventions or procedures, and that should be upfrontly told to them. It is a responsibility of the researcher to provide ancillary care for any non-study or trial-related illness, and he should anticipate and budget for that. And therapeutic misconception, that is a distinction between research and treatment. So many of the times, uh, in research, there will be patients, like in our uh, uh, studies, we, we take TB patients and try to uh, give a different kind of a therapy for them. So it is patient will not be able to distinguish between research and treatment, and that is a responsibility of the study team to explain in detail about that to avoid any therapeutic misconception. The adverse effects of the drugs have to be reported in a timely manner. We have timelines for reporting serious adverse events within 24 hours of occurrence. The initial report has to be filed and within 14 days, the detailed report. And if in, in case of any trial-related injury, appropriate insurance coverage and uh, um, funding has to be available to meet the cost for patients. And uh, privacy is the right of the patient to, del uh, to give any information about them and confidentiality is for the data that is collected. So privacy and confidentiality has to be ensured. And any conflict of interest from the researcher's side has to be disclosed to the ethics committee because the primary interest that is uh, the research and the research findings should not be compromised by any other secondary uh, interest, which may be financial or non-financial aspect. Post-trial access. So this is one of the things that is very important as far as uh, trials with uh, drugs or vaccines are uh, concerned, because uh, it is not only enough that the community from which the study participants are drawn uh, is just over only after completion of the study. Something has to be given back to them. The drug has to be made available at a at a reasonable price or the vaccine has to be available for the community. So these kind of things upfront has to be taught in the study for post-trial access. Uh, it may be for the trial participant also. For example, in a cancer trial, if the drug is uh, proven, proven to be safe, how long that it would be given to the participant. So those kind of things have to be well thought of. And alternate therapies have to be informed to the participants. And it's very important to have a good community engagement as far as research studies are concerned, because that helps in, uh, in, in uh, uh, completing our recruitment in time. So payment for participation. So participants should be reimbursed for their travel expenses and they should be paid for the inconvenience incurred, that loss of wages. It may be in cash or in kind or both as deemed necessary. Some kind of food supplies can be given 
Additional medical services should be provided at no cost and in case of vulnerable participants, legally authorized representative which should be reimbursed for travel and other expenses. And most importantly, the ethics committee should review and approve all the payments to avoid undue inducements. So compensation in terms of research related harm. So if the participant is suffering a harm which has resulted because of the participation in research, they are entitled to financial compensation or other assistance. In case of death, if it's proved that it is trial related, their dependents are entitled to financial compensation and we have to have a budgetary provision for insurance and compensation. So uh, according to new drugs and clinical trial rules, there are a wide range of uh, uh, situations wherein uh, they call it as trial related injury, death or permanent disability. It can result from adverse effect of the pro uh, investigational product, violation of the approved protocol, scientific misconduct, failure of the investigation product to provide an intended therapeutic effect where the standard of care was not provided to the subject, uh, not providing required standard of care, although available in the placebo controlled trial, and adverse effects due to concomitant medication, adverse effect of a child in utero because of the participation of parent in this trial, and any clinical trial procedure involving in the study leading to serious adverse events. So as an investigator, it is very important to consider all this uh, a priori before uh, initiating the study because these things should never happen in your study, which can relate to, uh, which can result in harm to the participants. So measures to minimize risk would be exclusion of participants who may at increased risk from the study, careful review of investigational procedures causing harm or serious discomfort, and evaluation of available data to in the reporting of SAEs and, see, and steps to minimize uh, such risk, careful monitoring of participants in terms of managing adverse events, and robust resources and testing procedures for immediate resuscitation. This is more so in, in terms of phase one studies, and uh, that should be made available as at the earliest. So in terms of vaccines, so what are the uh, main ethical considerations? So some vaccines may contain active or live attenuated microorganism that possibly can cause a small risk of producing that infection. So the participant should be informed before that, uh, before itself, uh, before participating in the trial. And in control groups, the provision has to be made to provide free treatment for the disease. And uh, in terms of post-trial, the control group should receive the complete dose of the effective vaccine. For example, in the uh, uh, COVID uh, vaccine, which uh, studies which are uh, uh, which were done during that time. So clinical trials, they would usually compare it with a placebo. So if the uh, vaccine was found to be effective, so those in the control of the placebo arm should receive the effective vaccine. And recombinant DNA vaccine and products, you have to follow applicable government guidelines and regulations. So in terms of study design, so if, we, if the study is blinded, so in terms of managing adverse events and uh, uh, taking required action, unblinding mechanisms should be available to the researcher and should be outlined in the protocol. And when available therapy is effective in pre preventing serious harm such as death or reversible mortality, it is inappropriate to use a placebo. So placebo should not be used if there is an effective available therapy in terms of study designs. So if placebo is used, then you should have additional safeguards to protect the participants from harm, like clear-cut withdrawal criteria, intensive monitoring, rescue medications, et cetera. We can use an add-on trial design where uh, in investigation product or placebo is added to a standard of care. For example, in case of adjunct therapies, uh, like for example, we are looking at uh, vitamin C in uh, 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 ensuring early completion, early conversion of sputum cultures in TB patients, wherein one arm gets the standard of care that is anti-TB treatment. Uh, it is given along with vitamin C and the uh, other control arm gets the uh, same uh, anti-TB treatment along with placebo. So they both of them get the standard of care, which is anti-TB treatment. And then in addition, they are given vitamin C or placebo. So these are add-on trial designs and fewer patients can be uh, randomized to placebo group, like having two is to one randomization. And 
Transition to standard of care or, or active medicine for participants after research is completed for uh, post-trial arrangements. So implementing any positive result because placebo, it is equivalent to not getting anything. So in that arm, those kind of effective treatments subsequent to the completion of the trial has to be ensured. So uh, trials using diagnostic agents should follow same protocols as for trials on new drugs. In case of radioactive materials and x-rays, they should be used to more precaution in persons who have not completed family. In case of clinical trials among women for contraceptives, uh, if they are pregnant or lactating, should involve abundant precautions and care. Therapeutic misconception is high in oncology trials and you should uh, uh, care has to be taken to address this issue. So new technologies, if the product is uh, being used in trials, they should follow GLP, GMP and GCP, duly approved by appropriate authorities. So in terms of pregnancy and clinical trials, so uh, uh, it's not that women of childbearing age should be excluded from uh, clinical trials, but effective contraceptive methods have to be advised uh, if required in the clinical trial. In case of inadvertent pregnancy, the woman should be withdrawn from the trial and all efforts should be made to collect data on the drug effects as well as outcome for both mother and fetus. So risk benefit assessment must be done at all stages for both the mother and the fetus. And women should not be encouraged to discontinue nursing. So in some studies, we do not take women for who are lactating. So just for pa uh, participating in the trial, they should not be uh, encouraged to discontinue nursing. And uh, so that is very important. So investigator initiated clinical trials. So many trials will be applied. Uh, we will be applying funding to a funding agency, but uh, there are some trials which are investigator initiated. So investigator will have the dual responsibility of uh, investigator as well as a sponsor. So in that case, financial arrangements have to be made by the institution uh, and the investigator for conduct of the study, for accounting for research-related injury, compensation, etc. So institutional arrangements have to be uh, made and institutions should have policies to ensure quality of data generated and safety of the intervention. For students conducting clinical trials as part of academic thesis, the guide and the institution to, should take up the responsibility of the sponsor. So in terms of collaborative research, like multi-centric studies and uh, multi-country studies, uh, issues like ownership of materials and data, intellectual property rights, joint publications, managing the research findings, conflict of interest, commercializing the research outcomes, all these things should be taught at the level of conceptualizing as well as prior to initiation of the study. And a detail of memorandum of understanding is important in terms of collaborative research. So the new drugs and clinical trial rules 2019, amendment 2022, the medical device rules 2017, amendment 2020, and we have national guidelines for stem cell research, uh, gene therapy, product development, clinical trials, etc. So the investigator should be aware of all these rules that guide uh, uh, research in terms of clinical trials and they should uh, adhere to them at each and every step. And in terms of alternate medicines like Ayush, there's a good clinical practice guidelines for clinical trials in Ayurveda, Siddha and Yuna Yunani medicine from the Department of Ayush, which can be referred to for these type of clinical trials. Uh, to end with, it's very important that we conduct research with utmost integrity and the uh, ICMR guidelines for research integrity and publication ethics talks about approvals from, uh, from committees as, as uh, applicable, conducting research in accordance with ICMR national ethical guidelines, maintaining integrity in data collection, analysis and reporting, and uh, avoiding scientific misconduct by avoiding plagiarism, fabrication, and falsification. So the take-home messages as far as it's not only for clinical trials, for any type of research is autonomy, beneficence, and justice should be upheld in research. The right safety and well-being of research participants have to be ensured. There should be a detailed ethical review of research prior to initiation. Privacy and confidentiality of research participants to be ensured. Additional safeguards for vulnerable population, 
compensation for re research related harms and case of drug trials, therapeutic misconception to be avoided. And uh, the researcher has to be aware of all guidelines and refer to guidelines as and when applicable. Thank you for your patient hearing and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. That was a very good and exhaustive presentation on the ethical considerations. We do have some interesting questions in the chat box, but we will take all the questions together after the three, all the speakers have completed. Uh, so I now uh, invite Dr. Prashant uh, Ganeshan, who is the head of the Department of Medical Oncology at Jipmer uh, Puducherry. Uh, he has done his training uh, in uh, oncology from Polynesian Central Medical Sciences, Delhi, followed by a stint at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, he has been a faculty in Cancer Institute, other Chennai, before joining JIPMA. And he, his primary interests are lymphomas, ovarian cancer, and supportive therapy in cancer. And he has been involved as a principal or co-investigator in multiple academic and spon industry-sponsored trials. And he is also the lead investigator for the Network of Oncology Clinical Trials India, which is a collaboration of six centers involved in clinical trials. So... Uh, Dr. Ganeshan will talk about the uh, Data Safety and Monitoring Board, which is a very essential component in case of a clinical trial. Uh, Dr. Ganeshan, please. Sir, your voice is not audible. I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Now we can hear you. Right. Uh, thank you very much. So I thank ICMR for giving me this uh, opportunity. So over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we're going to talk about data and safety monitoring boards. What is their importance in clinical trials? Basically, a DSMB, so a DSMB as it's commonly called, it's a group of individuals with appropriate expertise who review clinical trials on a regular basis. They look at the accumulated research data which has been uh, produced until that point on a clinical trial. And based on the interpretation of the data, they advise the sponsor, the researcher, uh, possibly the ethics committee regarding continuing safety of the trial participants, whether should this trial should continue or this trial should stop. This is the primary aim of the DNSMB. But they will also look at other aspects and probably guide the trial to go in the correct manner. So they can give inputs in that uh, respect also, but primarily to see whether this trial is okay to continue or not. That is the primary purpose of the DNSM. So we're going to look at what is their functions, what type of studies require DSMBs, how are these uh, DSMBs constituted, and certain practical aspects of how DSMB meetings are conducted. So this is what I'm going to try and cover. So the terms itself can be varying. Most of the time we use the term DSMB. Uh, sometimes they're also called as independent data monitoring committees to stress on the fact that uh, they have to be truly independent. A simpler term is just data monitoring committee or a data review board. Varying terms are used. The most popular ones are of course DSMB and the DMC, which has been variably used in various regulatory documents. So, why do we need this? Why can't the sponsor or PI do the same assessment? Obviously, it is to prevent bias uh, of uh, the information. So what happens if the sponsor or the PI themselves look at the data is that if they find that one arm is doing well or one arm is doing not so well, they can be biased in subsequent conduct of the trial and in terms of recruitment of the participants. To prevent this, somebody independently should look at the data, particularly in the context of a randomized clinical trials, that's where this is most applicable. So they protect the integrity of the clinical trial from adverse impact of access to the trial information. So this concept uh, evolved in the 1960s in the US, uh, particularly with the National Institute of Health, when they started, when the, when the, when the concept of randomized trials and multi-center trials really took off across the board in all uh, disease situations. So they, they wanted to see how the trials can be monitored better. So they, uh, this person called Greenberg, he issued a report and recommended the NIS for their studies to have an independent data monitoring committee. So one of the first trials was a coronary drug project which had an IDMC. 
the concept itself moved on to the industry sponsored trials probably in the late 1980s and the first trial to have uh, this concept was a cemented in stress ulcer clinical trial later on it became more of a common practice for, for most regulatory trials to have idmcs even when the likelihood of harm is deemed to be low and i'll tell you in a moment why it's not always about the harm it's al also about wastage of resources you cannot continue a trial even if there is a very low risk of harm if the trial is ultimately not going to yield a positive benefit so some trials are just futile and there's no point pumping in money to keep running the trial and recruiting thousands of participants the end result is not going to be useful for further patient care patient management so in that situation also dsmbs can take a call to stop the trial so there are various reasons to have the dsmb and finally the fda came out with a beautiful guideline document in 2006 and even now this is the go-to document to understand the functioning of DSMBs. If you look at the Indian guidelines, this beautiful document from ICMR, which the previous speaker also referred to, this particular document refers to the DSMB in three or four sections. Uh, even though there is no separate guideline on how to constitute a DSMB and how to run a DSMB in the ICMR guidelines per se. So one area is ethical issues relating to reviewing a protocol under this section the icmr guideline mentions that adequate provisions must be made for monitoring and auditing the conduct of the research including the constitution of dsmb if applicable for example in clinical trials in the section 411 reports of monitoring done by the sponsor and the dsmb may be sought under the section continuing review in section 7 clinical trials of drugs and other interventions the ICMR refers to the DSMB as part of the policies that an institution must establish. So that includes having a policy on DSMB also. This is especially in the context of investigator initiated clinical trials. So it's not just the sponsored clinical trials who should have a DSMB. If an investigator initiated clinical trial qualifies to have a DSMB, then it should also have, and the institution should have guidelines on how that DSMB should function. That is the ICMR guideline, what, that's what they are saying. Another context is in the research during humanitarian emergencies and disasters. So there, there are multiple concerns because there may be consent waiver and things like that because it's a research which is happening in an emergency. So it's all the more desirable to set up a DSMB to frequently look at the review of the data and to check on the risk which is being allotted to the participants. The NDCT rules of 2019 does not refer to the term DSMB at any point of time in the document. So this is where we stand in terms of the regulatory perspective in India. So DSMBs have been advised by the ICMR and it is part of many of the sponsored clinical trials which are currently ongoing in the country. So how to set up and run the DSMBs? So most of this is derived from this particular guideline document, which is a very comprehensive document, but the document itself uh, is a guideline clearly as stated by the US FDA, and they clearly mention this is not a binding document. One important thing is that you can have one DMC which can monitor multiple studies following the principles which are important. Again, all trials need safety monitoring, safety reporting, but a DSMB is not always needed. This has to be kept in mind. Why this hesitation to have DSMB in all trials? Because yes, the DSMBs adds to the administrative complexity of the trial. The additional resources have to be allocated for it. So we have to look at where we need DSMBs. DSMBs are particularly important when the study important study endpoint is very dichotomous and can have a clearly favorable, clearly unfavorable result. Especially, uh, for example, something which has a mortality endpoint. So. This is very important if a particular arm of a study is tending towards more mortality, definitely we need to look at whether the study should continue or stop at an interim time point. So that's what the DSMB can advise there. If you have a particularly invasive or toxic treatment, again, for the same reasons that you don't want to harm more participants than is required. So an interim assessment becomes important. A DSMB is the only person who can do that objectively without biasing the trial results. When the trial is conducted in vulnerable, or fragile populations like children, pregnant women, elderly, terminally ill populations, somebody with a diminished mental, mental capacity. Again, a DSMB may be more important to stringently look at the interim results. 
And of course, <clears throat> long duration, multi-center, large recruitment trials. Again, this is in terms of <clears throat> wanting to avoid futile trials. Sometimes recruiting 3,000, 4,000 patients, at the end of it, you're going to have a, a no result or a, you're not going to change practice. And if that result could have been known halfway down the trial, we could have saved a lot of resources. So in these situations also, a DSMB is called for. When is a DSMB not required? <clears throat> phase one, phase two, small trials, pilot studies do not require DSMBs because by the time the DSMB is constituted and has to look at the data, the trial itself will be completed. So there is no point. Studies which are focused only on simple endpoints like symptom relief, the trial whenever it is completed quickly. <clears throat> Sometimes if there is a high risk trial, which is going to be completed quickly, but you still have to be careful about recruiting too many participants, the trial can be done in a stop-go fashion. You can pause the trial in between, look at the data, and then decide to continue the next phase of the trial. So it can be done that way also. And in that context, a DSMB becomes important. So just talked about when we need a DSMB and when we do not require a DSMB. How is a DSMB different from the IRB? Doesn't the IRB also look at the safety of the patient? It's also concerned about it. Yes, it is. But one important thing is that IRB evaluates the safety information only from one site. Each site has its own IRB. So an IRB in GIPMER is going to look at the data of the trial from GIPMER. Whereas in a multi-center trials with 50 centers, 100 centers, a DSMB is the only person who can look at the data from the entire population of patients which have been enrolled across multiple sites. So they have much more access to data and they have actually access to the individual data so that they can analyze and look at the safety as well as the interim efficacy aspects. So a trial can have multiple IRBs, but there's only one DMC. But importantly, in for a particular site, the IRB is the king. The DMC reports have to go to the IRB, but the IRB reports doesn't have to go to the DSMB, but the DSMB can, of course, talk to the IRB and vice versa. So how do you establish the DSMB? There are two components here. One is the functioning component and the people who run the DSMB. So who are going to be the members who selects the uh, DSMB members, usually the sponsor, or if it's a large trial as a steering committee, they can appoint the members of the steering committee, uh, of, of the uh, members of the DSM. How do you choose the people? So most important is area expertise. If you're running a trial in cardiology, it has to be a cardiologist with experience in running trials in cardiology. It's a trial in oncology, corresponding area experience. Because they must understand the risks versus benefits. Sometimes these nuances can be very, very difficult to uh, differentiate and you have to take a call on stopping a trial. So it has to be an expert who can take those calls. And if a person has a previous experience in DSMB, at least one of the members should have that experience so that they know how to run these things. It becomes important. The additional people can be ethicists, pharmacologists, epidemiologists. Most importantly, none of them should have any serious conflict of interest with the trial. Maintain the confidentiality. Generally, it's desirable to have one or two inexperienced people inside so that they gain experience and they can run future DSMBs. How many members? Usually three to ten, but minimum is three. At least two clinicians and one biostatistician is very important. One of them can be the chairperson of the uh, DSMB. So what is the DSMB charter? DSMB charter is the organizational document which tells us how the DSMB should run. It should have information on members, if the member resigns, what are you going to do? How do you replace the member? What kind of reimbursement you're going to give for the members? What confidentiality agreement? Because the members are privy to a very important trial data. And so they have to sign a confidentiality agreement. What are the roles and responsibilities of each of those members? What is the overall safety monitoring plan? Uh, how are, when, at what point the DSMB is going to meet and look at the interim data? And uh, what are going to be the stopping rules for the DSMB if, they, if they're going to advise to stop? Uh, how do you assess the conflict of interest and uh, the communication procedures between the sponsor and the DSMB and the DSMB IRB and back to the sponsor. So the whole thing has to be written down clearly and this is usually part of the main protocol document. So this is what is called as a DSMB charter. So the composition actually I already went through this. There are three to ten voting members, physician in the speciality area, epidemiologist, methodologist, biostatistician. You can add other members as required. The chair should have prior DSMB experience. He should be a person who is capable of facilitating discussion and integrating various uh, point of views. And more importantly, for a long trial, sometimes it runs for four years, five years, you might have 10, 20, 25 DSMB meetings in between. 
So this is a person who must be willing to commit his time. Uh, that is also very crucial. In addition, you can have non-voting members, and I talk about it when I talk about how the meeting runs. And these can be actually members from the sponsors, the reporting statistician, as well as the steering committee chair or the study chair itself. But they do not have privy to the uh, more crucial information which is available to the DSMB. So the information which comes to the DSMB, where they break the codes and look at which group is what, etc. That information should never ever go back to the sponsor or to the clinician unless the trial is stopping. Because they have access to unblinded interim data. This is very important. And the results of the interim analysis. So the confidentiality procedures must be established beforehand. It should be written into the DSMB charter. Ensure minimization of the bias. Whatever reports comes out from the DSMB, the minutes of the DSMB meeting, there should be no leakage of these uh, documents to the sponsor or the PIC. Even when trials are not blinded, let's say, let's take a trial, which is randomized trial. The trials are not blinded. So each investigator knows what the patient got. But even then, when you do an interim analysis, <clears throat> there is going to be some result which favors one arm or the other. And that can influence the subsequent uh, participant enrollment and the conduct of the trial itself. So even in an unblinded trial, the results of the interim analysis are sacrosanct. Only the DSMB members can look at it. So these are the... Uh, components of the charter. I think I don't want to go through this again. I think we will uh, skip that. Practical aspects, meeting scheduling, should it be once in three months, once in six months, once in a year? Everything depends on how fast the trial is accruing, when the endpoints are met for the interim analysis to be done. But usually at least annual, but can be more frequent. Extra issues, extra meetings can be called for if there are more essays and reports of essays, new AEs. Uh, if there are new, new information from other trials which are ongoing. So similar trials may be ongoing in the same area and some information has come which shows that the, the, the test drug that you're using is not so as uh, effective as you thought it was. So you want to modify something here, the DSMB can be called for, look at the data at that point of time. So it's not <clears throat> hard and fast. There is a certain schedule, but it can be broken as required. Would it be an in-person versus online meeting? Doesn't matter as per the convenience and requirements. Interactions between the DSMB and the sponsors in the PI. So I'll, I'll go through that. So there can be open sessions and as well as closed sessions. So the PI, the sponsors can be part of the open sessions, but for the closed session, only the DSMB. Typically, the DSMB should have a meeting before the commencement of the trial, uh, before the first patient is enrolled, where they discuss the analytical plan, the consent form, the data collection instruments, Suggest any modifications at that point of time because you cannot go back and correct this once patients have started enrolling and confirm once again the meeting schedule, the SOP, the charter, the format for the reports, and the quorum which they're going to accept as the DSMB meets in future. Generally, you have a data safety monitoring plan which looks at the monitoring aspects and how the unanticipated problems are going to be reported and when they are going to do the suspensions and terminations. All these things are written up, discussed, and agreed upon. So come to the actual DSMB meeting. There is an open part of the meeting and a closed part of the meeting. In the open part of the meeting, the meeting can be open to the sponsors where the data is looked at in aggregate. So suppose there are 500 patients enrolled in a trial and you have total of 100 SAEs. So we don't know which arm the SAEs happened. You just know 100 SAEs. They can look at all 100 SAEs and see what were the SAEs, everything. That's all fine. So that data in aggregate can be open. It doesn't have to be Close. So, pooled toxicity, pooled efficacy data, all these 500 patients, you can look at them and say, okay, at the end of three years, there is a 40% survival or a 50% survival. So, that is perfectly fine. You don't know which arm they are. So, that kind of an open data discussions, you can look at aspects of approval, dropouts, uh, adherence to the trial protocols. These are open data, not uh, unblinded in terms of which group it is. So, these can be discussed to know how well the trial is enrolling whether the eligibility criteria are being adhered to. So these kind of information is important. This is also something which the DSMB would want to or should be looking at. So this will not influence the trial conduct, but it's important for the overall management. The study team will attend. So this is the open part of the discussion where, the, where these uh, the, the things are looked into. Now we come to the closed section. This is where the unblinded data is available to the DSMB. They look at the comparative outcome data, comparative safety data. Usually, this analysis is conducted by the biostatistician who is part of the DSMB. So, he must be well versed, thorough with the protocols of the trial 
the the the, the entire statistical uh, concepts behind that particular trial and this report and this discussions are not shared with the sponsor at the end of it there is an executive section where they just discuss all these things and they just give a written recommendation to sponsor the trial should continue or the trial should stop so and of course if there is a conflict and there is no consensus it is done by voting matters to be reviewed by the dsmb at any point is the research protocol interim data for the adverse event interim data for the efficacy and the data quality completeness compliance adherence so the present results can be given as group a and group b it is not mandatory uh, that the dsmb should know which is group a and group b that is always not mandatory so the test may be a the control may be b the dsmb need not know that enough if they know that okay group b is considerably worse than group a so let us uh, there is a lot of toxicity in group b so it is not okay for group b to con continue let's stop the group b it may turn out that the group b is actually the control arm but even then it is ethically right to stop the trial so um, it can be like that it can be also that the they they know what is group a and group b so that all depends on the trial and the situation how much openness needs to be there and how much of the unblinding should happen the statistical assessments of the interim data is usually predefined because you have to account for additional analysis in terms of the sample size. So this is all usually written up so that there is no additional type 1 and type 2 error uh, depending on how you're going to look at the results. So this is all usually predefined and as per the charter. And the report from the DSMB should con constitute these things. That is a summary of the protocol, how it has gone till that point, the recruitment follow-up, the baseline data, the randomization processes, outcome, and AE assessment. Clear-cut recommendation, which has to be shared with the sponsor if there is a steering committee, if the steering committee, and the IRB. So the impact of the DSM, we just to give you a couple of examples. In recent times, in 2004, a very uh, key drug um, called uh, Rofecoxib uh, was tried. So it's primarily an arthritis drug. It was trialed in patients with colonic polyps. And... Uh, the DSMB, which looked at the data, showed that there is increased cardiovascular uh, events in patients who are taking this drug, and uh, they they recommended termination of the trial. And uh, the impact was that there was a very significant drop in the share prices of uh, the company work. There was there are the other examples also, like uh, there was a large multi-center trial of hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women. This had to be terminated because the interim results showed clear benefits of the HRT. So the, the DSMB felt that continuing the control arm was not ethical. So the trial had to be stopped and the recommendations given. So it can go either ways. Uh, but again, to emphasize that the DSMB plays a very crucial role in the conduct of the trial. But again, there is a lot of uh, controversy here in terms of the ethics versus the science because you're taking a call uh, with the with sometimes what is called what is it can be called as a half baked uh, situation because without the full enrollment you are taking a call and you know, if uh, the call can be wrong at uh, uh, during uh, sometimes and uh, especially when the nominally uh, statistically significant benefit uh, which may emerge at the interim point and you take a call but if the trial had persisted fully you may not have found the difference so the false positives are due to early stop when recommending stoppage for harm. If you have a new intervention, you see a lot of toxicity, and at interim point, you stop it. But actually, if you follow it up, you find that even though some people had toxicity, in the end, the intervention um, ended up having higher survival. So it would have been worthwhile to continue the trial. You land up with inconclusive results, and then you may have to redo the whole trial again. These kind of situations will land up. So these are some of the tricky aspects. Uh, to some extent can be prevented by having very clear-cut rules, rigid uh, uh, DSMB charter, which describes all the uh, things to be looked into. And also a lot of nuances come. That's why we keep saying that you need to have a very good uh, committee with a lot of experts who can really tease out what is important and not jump and stop trials just because they see some alarming uh, things at some point. Of time. So there are additional responsibilities of the DMC. The overall study conduct can be monitored because they have access to all this data, so they can look at that. Uh, reviewing ex external data, so if there are other trials which have come out with some other results which are uh, going to influence the continuation of this trial, they have to look at that. They have to make clear-cut recommendations, as I already told, 
and maintain meticulous meeting records because all this data is very important. And again, uh, maintain the closed session data absolutely confidential. So these are the responsibilities of the DSMB. So I come to the end of my talk. Just to summarize, DSMBs are essential for conduct of certain types of clinical trials, especially randomized trials uh, run by the industry, but also large randomized trials involving multi-centers, uh, even for investigative initial trials, which qualify a DSMB is a mandatory uh, requirement. It are mainly aimed at ensuring the safety of the participants, but also important, avoiding wastage of resources by early stoppage of futile trials. They can provide guidance to sponsors, PIs, and IRPs. And a very important aspect to stress again is the independence of the DSMB and keeping the results confidential without any leakage to the sponsor or to the PIs. With that, I would like to stop and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, if there are a couple of quick questions, I'd be happy to take them because uh, I'm really sorry. I may have to go because I have one more meeting, uh, if that is all right uh, with the ICMRT. Yeah, sure. That was a very exhaustive uh, presentation. If anybody has any particular question regarding the DSMB, please type it in the uh, chat box. Till now, we don't have anything regarding DSMB. Uh, we will collect the questions and probably uh, send it to over to you, and then we can um, send the answers to the uh, whoever has asked. All right. Thank you so much for that. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry I have to leave the meeting. No, no, no problem. No problem. Right. So we next uh, next we have. Uh, Okay, so sorry, uh, there is a one question which says that uh, whether we require DSMB in a food-based trial, in nutraceutical trials. So it all depends on, uh, so uh, if the if you look at the end point of a trial, if the end point is a very uh, so-called soft end point, like you're just looking at some safety or some improvement in the nutritional status, which is not uh, which is not going to be like life-threatening kind of endpoint or something like that. You don't need to have a DSMB. But on the other hand, if your trial is going to enroll 2,000 patients and uh, you don't want to, you know, uh, keep you on know, enrolling uh, futile yeah. uh, enrollment, uh, you, you could know the results after 1,000 patients. You don't have to spend, uh, you know, money on 2,000 patients. So from that perspective, it may be useful to have a DSMB for early stoppage. So it all depends on how your trial is set up so it's very individualized uh, decision. It's not mandatory to have a, a DSMB. So, but if your trial is very large, you may want to consider. Yes, sir. We, I uh, totally agree with your uh, assessment. But usually, nutraceutical trials are large trials. I mean, the effects are so small that you need a large sample size. Right. And as, right. as you said, we have to individualize the case as whether we need or DSMB or not. For uh, on a Personal note, I always feel that DSMB is a good thing to have because that's an independent review who tells you whether you are conducting the trial properly or not. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Prashant. And uh, we will not keep you from your next meeting. Uh, so we go over to the next speaker, Dr. Jaydeep Bokte. Uh, he is an, a pharmacologist from KM Hospital in Mumbai and has been with CIPLA since 1994. Currently, he is the global chief medical officer who is responsible for medical affairs, clinical trials, and pharmacovigilance. And he has multiple publications, conference presentations, and his main areas of work are drug development and respiratory disease, HIV AIDS, and infectious diseases. So we invite Dr. Tape to take us through the uh, you know, minutiae of uh, regulatory um, trials, the aspects when we are talking of a regulatory trial. Uh, sir, please. Yep. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. And uh, uh, can you all see my slides? No, sir. It is just saying you are sharing screen. Okay. We did see the slide before that, but then they just disappeared. Okay. Just a second. I'm just having... Yeah, we, we can see that. You can see them now? Okay, wonderful. Now we can see, yes. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to ICMR team for their kind invitation. Uh, 
I think this was alluded to earlier in the first presentation that the new Drugs and Clinical Trials Act of, nine, of 2019 was introduced and an official notification to this came into effect just a few months ago, which, uh, which says that now, therefore, all new clinical trials that we do in India, especially for new So I'm going to focus on the regulatory aspects of clinical trials. Uh, from the being from the pharmaceutical industry, uh, this is where we generally focus on. So we do know that clinical trials and studies of new drugs, that means drugs which are not yet approved in India or uh, drugs which are classified as new drugs under the law are regulated by the CDSCO. And we do know that a clinical trial or a clinical study covers any investigation in human subjects to discover or verify the clinical pharmacological effects of a drug or to identify any adverse reactions to an investigational product or to study the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of an investigational product with the object of ascertaining the safety and efficacy. The, the terms clinical trial and clinical study are used synonymously. So in brief, uh, what does this really mean? Is that whenever we are studying a new drug for its clinical efficacy, which is usually in phase two or in larger phase three, or sometimes the mechanism of action of pharmacodynamics, which is, for example, looking at the effect on biomarkers. Uh, as an example, we have a lot of new drugs for the treatment of severe asthma dominated by eosinophils in the sputum. So in phase three, the clinical endpoints may be reducing asthma exacerbations. But in phase two, uh, before we look at clinical endpoints, which will come up for a long time, we do look at effect on biomarkers, such as the presence of eosinophils in the sputum. That's, of course, also covered by CDSO guidelines if you want to do that study. Safety and tolerability studies, which could be, which are usually in phase two, phase three. But of course, much larger phase four studies are often required as a post-marketing requirement to look at safety once a drug is released into a general population. In addition, pharmacokinetics, which could be phase one or in phase two, or very commonly done in India are bioequivalent studies, which are, uh, which are done by a second applicant uh, to the CDSU. Now, what I mean here to say is that if, if a particular drug is not yet approved in India and you are the first applicant, then you have to conduct a phase three clinical trial to demonstrate efficacy and safety, provided that drug is already approved in any string by any stringent regulatory authority across the world. By stringent regulatory authority, it usually covers the US, Europe, the UK, Japan, Australia, Canada. Other countries may not constitute a stringent regulatory authority, and therefore that approval may not be given consideration by the CDCO's office to simply do a phase three trial. If you successfully, once you successfully complete the phase three trial and get approval, other pharmaceutical sponsors, which may want to introduce the same drug in the market, do not need to do a clinical trial. They have to do what is called as a bioequivalent study, where simply the rate and extent of absorption of their product is compared with either your product or the innovator's product from the US or Europe, and demonstrate that CMAX AUC is similar, falls within the 80 to 125% uh, intervals. And if that is proven, then the second or the subsequent new applicant can launch the drug as well. So there are clear differences when you're the first applicant for a drug or when you're the second applicant for a drug. I think it was alluded to earlier that a new drug is not just a new drug that is being introduced for the first time in the country, but if the drug appears now as a combination product along with another drug which may already been approved or a new dosage form, you want to switch from an injection to a tablet or a tablet or injection, or a tablet to a topical cream or a nasal spray, that require, that is considered as a new drug. Or if you were to expand your label, let's say for metformin from diabetes to polycystic ovarian syndrome, that requires a clinical trial to demonstrate the safety and efficacy because it's considered as a new drug. So clearly phase three clinical trials are not just for approval of the drug, but for approval drug in a second indication or as a part of another combination or in the new dosage form, or even the new study population. All these kinds of trials for new drugs can only be initiated after obtaining approvals from the Central Licensing Authority, that is the CDSCO's office. We also know that registration of the clinical trials on the CTRA website is mandatory prior to recruitment of the first patient in the study. 
do remember that permission that you obtain from the licensing authority for conduct of the study is valid for a period of two years. Usually the clinical trial review and approval process is facilitated within 90 days uh, for clinical trials. And for indigenous drugs developed in India, it is actually 30 days shorter. So that gives a good incentive for companies to develop drugs in India. We all know that once we make an application to the DCGIS office, it goes to a subject expert committee who reviews the protocol, the product, and then gives an approval depending on uh, whether they are satisfied with the protocol of the clinical trial, or they may make some suggestions to modify it. If there is a rejection, the sponsor can request the authority to reconsider the application within a period of 60 working days from the date of rejection. And if for some reason the sponsor or the company decides to terminate, it needs to be notified to the licensing authority with appropriate justification. There are other aspects of the NDCJ 2019, and of course, there is no time, there's not enough time to cover all the detail, but there are chapters, there are schedules. Importantly, there is a definition of the orphan drug, now, which was mentioned in NDCT as a drug that is intended to treat a condition that affects not more than five lakh persons in India. A new chemical entity or NC has also been defined as any substance that has not been approved as a drug by any drug regulatory agency and is proposed to be developed as a new drug for the first time in India. So that's interesting. We do have a few NCs now being developed by pharmaceutical companies based in India. And I think that's very, very encouraging to see how research is moving in the right direction. Uh, this looks a bit complicated for the entire clinical trial pathway, but I'll make it brief and really focus on two or three areas. Uh, as a pharmaceutical company, when we decide on a clinical trial, one of the key things that is important is a proper, first and foremost, a CDA or a confident, non-confidence or a confidential agreement with the investigator. Uh, what, in addition, we do is the site feasibility, evaluation, protocol discussion, have a formal clinical trial agreement signed with the, uh, with the site. All these essential documents are submitted to the licensing authority for what we call as a CTNOC. That means a no objection certificate for conducting the phase three trial or the phase two trial. This is submitted to DCGI through form 21. It is then sent to a subject expert committee, which invites you to a presentation where you actually have to make a full presentation of the protocol. And then as per the discussion, we will hear the outcome of this. At this place, we also have to either submit whatever ethics committee permissions we have or subsequently, Ethics committee permissions have to be submitted before the trial is initiated in those sites. And I think that was very well said in the first presentation. Uh, there's a subject recruitment, there is a routine monitoring happens between the sponsor, the investigator, the ECs, and where are required, the DSMB, audits are, cre audits are done. Once the study recruitment is completed, the study is done, data cleaning happens, validation, statistical analysis, a clinical study report is generated, as you can see here. And this is uh, submitted to the central licensing authority for, uh, for getting marketing permission. Once again, the company is invited to present the results of the phase three study to the authority. And if the expert committee is satisfied with the results, permission to market the drug is eventually granted. When the permission letter comes to the sponsor or to the company, it may include additional requests such as please conduct a phase four clinical trial or do a post-marketing surveillance or submit more information, including your promotional materials before you launch the product. So there are two or three areas where during the clinical trial, there are interactions with the licensing authorities. One is the protocol submission and approval. At the end is of course, the, the submission of the clinical study report. But in the middle, uh, you have to submit ongoing reports of how your study is progressing. While you may decide to submit an annual study report for a very long trial, but a quarterly report, a quarterly report is recommended for what's the enrollment going on. A six monthly report may be, re may be requested for looking the overall status, etc. And therefore, there are periodic times when you have to submit data to the regulatory authorities on the clinical trial. We do know that important stakeholders in the trial are not just the drug developers or the sponsors. But very often, companies use contract research organizations to actually conduct a trial on their behalf. So they're important stakeholders because they're actually the people who will be monitoring the sites on the ground. Investigators are stakeholders. The clinical study sites or the hospitals are also important stakeholders in the, in the whole trial. Of course, the regulatory authorities, the ECs, and not to forget the participants 
uh, the patients or even nowadays in many countries, patients organizations are closely involved in uh, clinical trials. So I have very briefly listed out the key responsibilities and I will not cover ethics committees because that's been covered. But for the drug company or the contract research organization, it's important to maintain a strong oversight and monitoring that the clinical trial is conducted as per the protocol. The data is, that is generated, documented and reported is in compliance with the protocol and of course, good clinical practice. As I said, you can give a status report on the trial to so the CDSU at different time points, quarterly, six monthly, annually. I think very importantly, the entire issue on serious adverse events was covered. Uh, SAEs have to be reported by the sponsor to the CDSUs, to ethics committee, to the institution head, and important other investigators to know as well. And a decision may have to be taken whether the consent form needs to be altered uh, when the trial is in the progress. And I do remember a case where many years ago, we were running a phase three clinical trial of an anti-obesity drug, which was approved uh, in Europe. During the course of our phase three trial, additional side effects were reported in Europe. And we had to go back and speak to each of the investigators and have a second version of the informed consent form to the patients and submit it to all ECs and wait for approval before the trial continued. Uh, I think compensation in case of death has been discussed. Very importantly, a company has to do post-trial access for a, for a drug. And I do recall one of my first projects in CIPLA was in the early 90s when we were doing a phase three trial on Lamotte regime in difficult to treat epilepsy. And that was probably for the first time that we provided post-trial access out of those very, out of the 40 difficult to treat patients, about 25 had shown a significant response. And it was mandated that all these 25 patients who had shown a response continue to re uh, receive the drug till the drug is actually marketed. Any trial that is prematurely discontinued, the company should submit a summary report justifying why it has discontinued. And this may of course be due to uh, uh, commercial interest as well. A company may decide not to develop a drug in the future, even though phase three trial is going on as part of its strategy. There are very, very important responsibilities for the investigator as well. And the key is really to conducting the trial as per the protocol and good clinical practice. Very, very important is proper documentation. And you know, that's a challenge we often have. Uh, maintaining good records, proper documentation, whether it be online or whether it be paper records, having source data for verification. The process of informed consent is extremely critical because this is where often uh, uh, points are noted and there could be a lot of questions that could come from the quality department or during audits about the entire process of informed consent. A trained and qualified personnel is important that the investigator has as part of his team. And of course, uh, I think SA reporting is something that has been covered a couple of times. I'm not going to cover uh, on ethics some days because that's been covered by the first speaker. So we all know what good clinical practices. It's an international ethical and scientific quality standard for design, conduct, recording, and reporting trials that involve participation of human subjects. I think the real importance of GCP is that it assures all of us that any trial that is done under GCP right, protects the rights, safety, and well-being of trial subjects, and the trial data that is generated is actually credible. In fact, Many journals require a statement when you submit a paper for publication that this trial was done uh, in, in, in compliance with good clinical practice. And I think this was also mentioned about academic clinical trials as part of NDCT 219 is generally for academic clinical trials, no permission is required from the CDSU's office because usually the drug has already been approved in the country and an academic institute is trying to use it for some other indication or in some other dose. Uh, in such a situation, the local ethics committee permission is usually enough. Uh, uh, and if there is any problem or if any, there is any doubt, then some kind of discussion may be sought with the uh, central licensing authority. Otherwise, generally academic clinical trials can be done with the consent or with the approval of the ethics committee itself. But uh, do note that data generated from this cannot be used for approval of the drug in the new indication or for other commercial or marketing purposes. Uh, many times we see that once we get approval for a drug, uh, there is a regulatory requirement for, for post-marketing studies. A phase four clinical trials is, is usually a requirement if a new drug has been granted waiver for a clinical trial. And I'll cover that in my subsequent slide 
or if there is a request for some additional drug drug interaction or safety studies. And in such situations, the protocol has to be submitted to the CDSCO and the subject expert committee will approve the protocol before you can actually start the trial. And the letter from the CDSCO's office usually says that please submit a protocol within three months so that you can then conduct the trial. Uh, if there is no need of a phase four, if a phase three was done, then usually there is a request for a post-marketing surveillance study, which is mostly safety study, where the eligibility criteria for this is no real protocol, but it's as per the prescribed information. And in such cases, the drug is not provided free because this is merely looking at, in the real world, what, about what happens to the safety and tolerability of a drug. So these are post-marketing surveillance study, which generally uh, are more safety than efficacy studies. Uh, there are a couple of other things that also one can have interactions with uh, the regulatory agency. Uh, one can also have what is called as a pre-submission meeting. That means before you submit your phase three trial protocol, uh, if you are unsure about the actual strategy or the clinical trial strategy for a product, one can seek guidance uh, about the requirements uh, as per the NDCT. And if you are not sure, actually seek a meeting where the DCGS office will call in a few experts and you can have a meeting with them to discuss the way forward for a particular drug. So we have had experience with one particular product where we did a pre-submission meeting, which was very helpful because I think when we then submitted a phase three protocol, uh, the questions were few because this had already gone through some kind of pre-submission discussion. One can also have what is called as a post-submission meeting if the applicant or the sponsor company wants a clarification when an application is pending, or there have been queries that have been raised, or there has been some reject, one can request a post-submission meeting with the licensing authority to really understand what are the queries, why these queries have come. Uh, this can be done formally uh, through a, through a post-submission meeting as well. Uh, there are a few situations in which a phase three clinical trial waiver may be granted. Uh, it has to meet the the few uh, the, these four conditions first of all. One is that the new drug is approved and marketed in countries which are specified by the CLA, that is, uh, I mentioned about the stringent regulatory authority, and there are no major serious unexpected adverse events that have been reported since the drug was marketed in that country. Uh, there is unlikely, on the basis of existing knowledge, that there could be any differences in the Indian populations in terms of pharmacogenetics that could alter the PKPD safety efficacy of the new drug. And the applicant gives an undertaking in writing to conduct a phase four clinical trial to establish safety and effectiveness of this drug. Uh, this is important that in some diseases which are of special relevance to India, uh, for example, MDR or XTR tuberculosis, hepatitis C, H1N1, dengue, malaria, HIV, or for rare diseases, one can request for a clinical trial waiver, but fulfill these top three or four conditions that I mentioned, that the drug should have been approved somewhere else in a stringent regulatory authority country. The company should agree to a phase four clinical trial, should show evidence based on existing knowledge. There is no genetic differences that could affect the outcome of the use of the drug in this population. So there can be situations in which a local clinical trial may be granted. So I'm going to uh, stop and, and summarize by saying that there are clear timelines in review for a review and approval of a phase three clinical trial. That's 90 days. The CT NOC, and sorry for that spelling error, uh, is valid only for two years. I think it was mentioned that the EC registration is now valid for five years. The sponsor must submit the CT report at the end of the trial. Pre and post submission meetings can be done. A CT over can be granted uh, in specific or it can be requested in specific conditions. SA reporting remains critical and the entire pharmacovigilance in a phase three trial is very, very important. And finally, post-marketing uh, requirements have been uh, uh, well-defined. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you all very much for your patient hearing and I'm happy to take any questions from you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gokse. That was a very clear uh, description of what is required in a regulatory trial. Uh, if there are any questions, please put it up in your uh, chat box so that we can read it out. But uh, from before, we had a few questions which uh, either Dr. Bhanurekha or you, yourself can take. One was, is there a requirement of insurance cover for academic trials? So my advice would be, yes, please do take insurance cover for academic clinical trials. 
the ethical okay. committee may ask for it and there could be questions related to compensation as well because a clinical trial is a clinical trial right sir uh, dr panurika do you want to comment yeah i would like to concur with uh, uh, sir that it is always uh, uh, important to take insurance because uh, for trial any uh, research related injury or for free medical management the institution for example if it is an academic institution they need to have a corpus fund allotted for that and uh, uh, research especially with any investigational product even if it's an approved drug carry some amount of harm and uh, if to be on the safe side it's very very important yes thank you ma'am so the message is yes we should take an insurance because there are very few uh, institutes in india which actually have has that corpus fund from where compensation can be given uh, there was another question as to uh, in in cases of thesis related products like somebody wants to do an rct as as their dm or md thesis does all the regulations apply i think in this uh, please ma'am would you uh, like to answer this yeah so like uh, I, i already mentioned in the talk so the institution and the guide would uh, be the sponsor in this and if there is going to be a investigational product that is going to be administered as part of the clinical trial to the study participant then it is always better to have a uh, insurance coverage for that yes so maybe i can quickly add that if the randomized controlled trial is comparing two already approved drugs then usually a, a regulatory approval need not be required uh, one can send a letter to the cdss office informing them about the trial uh, generally there is no requirement of approval and the ec approval should be sufficient but as mentioned earlier all the risks will always remain because it's finally a clinical trial Yes, sir. So to summarize, we do not need to go to the DCGI if it is already approved, but still the other rigors and the steps of the RCTs should be followed. Uh, there was another question as to what is the role of ethics committee in case of an adaptive design of clinical trial. We did have a session on adaptive design and role of ethics earlier, but Dr. Panurika, do you would want to take this question? so uh, basically to refresh our memory about adaptive designs it's like a pre specified uh, uh, criteria in your protocol about how the study design changes and the analysis changes as and when the study goes on in in a way it is a dynamic kind of a situation which you are dealing with so here the uh, the rules are the same you know the harms that are going to come out of it the benefits the risk benefit assessment the ethics committee has to go uh much in detail and here one advantage is if you if you feel that a regimen or a drug is not going to do good you're going to drop them in between so you're not going to expose more number of participants to that uh, regimen which is not going to work or that drug that is very harmful so the risk benefit assessment as well as explaining to the study participant about your study design uh is going to be a real challenge but uh, that has to be done appropriately uh, for this type of study designs uh thank you ma'am uh there are two more questions which one was academic clinical study funded by pharmaceutical company does it go does it have to go to dcj why should a pharmaceutical company fund an academic clinical trial i, I think they do not do that dr gokte would you please uh... no. no i can very much answer the question uh, in uh, so in pharmaceutical uh, lingo we call this investigator initiated trials so we often do get requests in fact we are currently providing some support for uh, a few clinical trials one is in one of the major cancer hospitals uh, we are and the support that the company provide may be in different ways provides the medications free of cost or may provide a grant or may provide both or may provide some support for example funding for statistical analysis so we do get requests for uh, funding of certain clinical trials which may be drug related or in non drug related and uh, some companies fund some companies may not but i know that in cipla we do provide funding for uh, or i want to say funding support for investigator initiated clinical trials Uh, thank you, sir. That makes it very clear, and even, I mean, it it adds to our and, knowledge. Yeah. That, so uh, I just mentioned uh, 
if this is on an existing drug, approved drug, it doesn't need to go to the CDC's office. Just for information, you may want to do that. It follows the academic clinical trials uh, uh, policy. Thank you, sir. There is another question, which, which is a very generic question, is that why do we mostly have phase two, phase three trials and not phase one trials? So I, you know, I, I have to tell you something interesting. If you do an analysis of the IND committee meetings in the last two years, I actually recently did an analysis. I saw that about 10 phase one trials are going on in India, which I thought was very interesting. That's actually uh, very encouraging. Yeah, that's very encouraging. And I know that we are, for the first time, we are doing a phase one trial in India, which is going to become begin in December. So do, I would urge you to go back and look at the IND committee minutes online. Thank you, sir. Uh, that is all. We also have a, a, a Dr. Lakshmi Narayan, who is our uh, DDG, also wants to ask a question. So we'll have to unmute him if he, uh, if, if he has a question. Unmute. So you have to unmute yourself. So Dr. Lakshmi Narayan, if you want to ask a question, you have to unmute your uh, mic. Okay, uh, so we will get back when we have the questions. And I think we had a very good and very stimulating and academic uh, discussion. Hello? Yep. So I'd just like to request the ICMR team that I could leave because I have another call at five o'clock. Yes, yes. yes, sir. Thank you very much. We would like to end the meeting also because it's already okay. five. And yep. uh, thank you for all to the all the participants uh, for the very interesting and stimulating conversations. If Dr. Lakshmi wants to ask his question last, he can. We have given you the right, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. And we look forward to thank our- Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.